who went up to worship at the feast. It came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, there remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That man who loves his life will lose it. Let me repeat that again. The man, verse 25, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Kind of the opposite of what we think. 26, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Verse 27, now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it, and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to them. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now in this time of judgment on this world, now the prince of this world be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Jesus comes to this time to tell his disciples the bad news. It's really the good news, but they see it as the bad news because they thought he was going to be the conquering king and was going to drive the Romans out and put back forth the kingdom of heaven right on earth right now. At this time, some Greeks had come to Jerusalem to worship. You see, just like you could become a Jew in the Old Testament, but you had to go through a class per se. You had to go through the system of do's and don'ts. And as we spoke a couple weeks ago, Jesus accepts us just as we are. He changes our heart and eventually changes some of the things we do in our lives, but he accepts us as we are because we don't get cleaned up to take a bath, right? Now, when I was a kid, we had to load the dishwasher. My younger brother, I got him pulled into washing the dishwasher, so he had to rinse stuff off and put it in dishwasher. And when it was already clean, then I emptied it. That was my part because I didn't want to touch any of that gross stuff, right? But you had to wash the stuff off for it, remember, or rinse some of the stuff before you put it in the dishwasher. Some of you had that had said had some of that had some of that same experience. Well, you don't have to do that with God. You just show up, and He changes you from the inside out. He changes your heart, and then you don't want to do the things that you used to do. But this time, the Greeks had come to Jerusalem to worship. Even though these Greeks were Gentiles, they were followers of the Jewish religion. But they had not become true Jews because they had not been circumcised. This is what we were talking about a couple weeks ago. They had to go through all the systems, all the rules and regulations of religion, right? Right. They had to do this first to be acceptable to do this. They had to get this degree. They had to go, go this person get ordained and do this and do that. These Greeks came to Philip, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and asked to see Jesus. They had heard about him and now wanted to meet him. Philip was not sure what to do, so he went and told Andrew, Peter's brother. But when Jesus heard that some Greek Gentiles were looking for him, he knew that it was a sign that the hour had come for him to be glorified. That is, sacrificed on the cross. See, we can know the time and seasons we can't know exactly the date when the Father has sent the Son back. Not even the Son knows. Only the Father knows. But if we are living in accordance with God, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, which we've accepted God as our Savior, because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, the Holy Spirit's in us, and we are listening to what God's saying, we are seeking Him, we can know round about when it's going to happen, Right? You know March Madness is going to happen in March. It's going to be towards the end, right? Because they wait to everything because they want viewership up, right? So you don't know exactly when Purdue is going to play, right? But you know they're, it's going to play in the next few days, right? When Jesus heard all of this, 
He knew he was about to be glorified. That is, sacrificed on the cross. Now the Gentiles had begun to turn to him. Now his witnesses would begin to spread outside Israel throughout the preaching of his disciples. So other churches, the ground floor of the church had already been started to be laid out, right? Some of you who've worked construction before, they put down a foundation. You know much more about this than I do, but you have to level it out, right? You have to get everything leveled first. Even if you're putting it on a hill, like in West Virginia, right, Grandma Shirley? You gotta get a level, you gotta, you gotta get that level. I remember my dad having that level when we used to camp at, and had the little yellow thing in the middle and you put it up there and you get your level on your camper so you don't fall asleep and end up in the creek during your, during at night, right? Then Jesus gave the reason why it was the right time for him to die. It was God's plan. This was total blasphemy to the Jews. They're coming back to take America back. I mean, Israel back again. All right? They were going to take it back. That's what they were going to do. And this is the exact opposite of what they wanted to hear. It was God's plan that only after Jesus' death would the Holy Spirit be sent to live in the disciples. It was all getting ready. It was all in a plan. Jesus said, if I go unto the Father, greater works you will do. Right? We said this a couple weeks ago. And we think, oh, it's about the miracles, signs and wonders. But Jesus said it was to the unfaithful generation that they cared about the miracles and signs of wonders. That's where the big crowds of the larger disciples, and we usually refer to the disciples or the apostles, the 11 or the 12, because later on Judas Iscariot passed away, right? Then we have Matthias come in. But Jesus said, greater things you will do because I go unto the Father, because you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Not only God the Father up on the throne, up in heaven looking down, and I'm going back to my Father and sit at his right hand, but the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, God one third of the Holy Spirit, who is fully part of God, who is person, who isn't just this extra thing that we get later on, is God will live within you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples would then spread the gospel all over the world because God is with us. He came to tabernacle with us. They would do greater things than Jesus had done himself. Then Jesus gave an agricultural illustration to those who've grown up on the farm and know that I don't know anything about that. Listen up. To show why his death was necessary. Any seed that is sown must, in a way, die and spread apart. Greater things will be done because a death comes to spread life. Before it can come to life, Jesus was like a kernel of wheat. By dying, he produced many seeds. And this, the 12 disciples who had spread it out, was it any Surprise that there were 12 disciples and there were 12 tribes of Israel. There's a little Old Testament tie in there for you. If you're a big Old Testament person. And from the 12 disciples, many other seeds had sprung up because many of them were martyred. As we know throughout history, Peter was crucified upside down. Many, John was in prison. Many other things happened to the disciples and their seed was spread. They had sprung up all over the world in increasing numbers. Although Jesus was comparing himself in particular with a kernel of wheat, the comparison is also true of Jesus' followers today. Whenever there is persecution, whenever anybody has a tough time and struggles for decades to establish a church, to establish a ministry, to establish a missionary base, this doesn't mean that all we have to do is physically die in order to produce fruit. Only some Christians are called to be martyrs. But we all must die to ourselves, which is even harder in this modern fulfillment of Roman Greco culture that we have. We're all about pleasing ourselves, and we all have modern conveniences. And trust me, I love them. I love the microwave. I love the drive-through 24-hour uh, convenience store and everything that's open. Look at me. <laughs> but we take convenience over sacrifice. 
Our old sinful self must die. Otherwise, we must not be able to bear fruit for Christ. We have to sacrifice. But once we turn our heart towards God and put our fulfillment in fulfilling his commitment, his purpose becomes our purpose. And then the sacrifice does occur. In fact, we love pouring ourselves out. It was hard for Jesus in his human state to give up, to suffer and die. But yet he knew that was his purpose, that he had come. Jesus said that the man who hates his life in this world will gain eternal life. Does that make any sense to the way we think? It doesn't make. We try to gain everything we can, right? All of us probably need spring cleaning. All of us probably need to clean out our garage and have a yard sale, right? And make some our junk somebody else's junk, right? Right? We have stuff and we love stuff and it makes us fulfilled. But what truly fulfills us is Christ in us, the Holy Spirit living in us. If we will lose our life, we will get those who shall become last, shall become first. The first shall become last and the last shall become first. Rather, he was saying that our love for him must be so great that in comparison, our love for ourselves will seem like hate or will be so small that we can't love ourselves, that we can't always be looking out for ourselves first. What makes us happy? What makes us comfortable? In fact, our desires will change and our, our desires to spread the gospel and to love other people and make sure other people are comforted are first. It's been said among many preachers that we are called to comfort the afflicted, but also we're called to afflict the comforted. Once in a while that happens, we have to afflict the comfort. Trust me, I don't like doing it. Sometimes in my humanness and my rage, I want to prove my point too. <clears throat> but as you grow more in Christ, you want to comfort the afflicted. Verse 26, let's read that again. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Whoever serves me must follow me. The Greeks sought Jesus. They sought him out. Are you truly seeking him out today? But to seek Jesus is not enough. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. Seek, Jesus, is only the first step. We must believe in him and then serve him. If we love Jesus, we want to serve him, we must follow him. And his desire should become our desires. Where Jesus goes, we must go. That means we must be ready to suffer and die with him. Now, not all of us will be called to suffer and die, we'll be called to martyr. But there'll be parts of our lives that we'll give up that we never thought we would ever give up before. The man who follows Jesus may lose his life in this world, may, he may lose his possessions. He may lose his three-day weekend. He may lose his honor in other men's eyes. But in exchange, he will live and get life with Jesus forever. Lay your treasures above. Lord willing in the creek, don't rise. Right, Grandma Shirley? He will also receive honor from God. God honors those who honor Christ. Because those who honor him. Verse 27. Now my heart is troubled, and all shall I say, Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. You see, Jesus was human, fully human, and fully God. We can't fully wrap our minds around that, so we have to accept it in faith. But we see that he was struggling. Then Jesus said to those around him, Now my heart is troubled. He was troubled because he was about to die. He was about to suffer a terrible death. To drag a heavy cross up the Via del Rosa, one of the highest hills in Jerusalem. To be beaten, to be scourged, to a crown of thorns upon his head. And to suffocate on a cross. That's what really dying on a cross is. They make you suffer and basically you suffocate to death. He knew he would be an excruciating, excruciating, if I can talk today, death. He was troubled because he was about to die. He was a man, and men don't ordinarily like to die. But Jesus was troubled, only, not only about dying. He was troubled because he was about to take on himself 
the punishment for all sins of all mankind for all time. He was about to be made sin for us, broken and poured out. He was about to be forsaken by both his disciples and his father for a short time. Jesus in his mind wondered for a moment if it would be possible to avoid such an hour. That is such a death. He asked himself, should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But immediately he thought, no. Such a prayer would be against my Father's will and would be against the purpose that I came to be on the earth, to spend this 30, 33 years, these last three years with the apostles, the disciples. It was the time to die, and this is why I came to the world. It was to take men's punishment so they wouldn't have to take it. That song that I sung today, in Christ alone, sin has lost its curse on me because he took it upon himself. I have come to this hour of death. In verse 28, Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. That is, let your name be glorified through my death, through my sacrifice. Then God said from heaven, although some wouldn't believe it, they said it was an angel or they thought it was just thunder. There's always going to be people who don't believe, so don't let that worry your heart. There's going to be some people that don't accept the truth of Christ, who don't accept that there's a God that loves them. You have to love them anyway. That's what you're called to do. That's what I'm called to do. Because God will change their heart in due time. God has glorified His Son by speaking at His baptism when He was baptized and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and rest upon him. And at his transfiguration up on the mountain. And he had glorified Jesus by giving him the Holy Spirit without limit, it says in John 3, 34. So if you have a pen, look, look that up. If you have a pen, write that down. The Gospel of John 3, 34. The Holy Spirit without limit. I have always said there's more of God out there to get. If you want more God, there's always more God out there to get. There's always more on the Holy Spirit. You don't arrive and get your watch or your grandfather clock because you've put in your time and you've done your quota with God, okay? I don't get a lot of ministers that retire when they're 65. And maybe they've got enough money to and then, then move off somewhere. God has called you to a calling. It's not just a job. It's a calling. I know one who's going to retire when he's 65, one that's going to keep going until he's 72 because his denomination requires them to register and stop at 72. But you can still do pulpit work. You can still do a lot of other things. God calls us to genuinely love and fulfill the gospel throughout our lives. Verse 29, the people heard the sound of this voice from heaven, but not all of them understood. To some it was like thunder, to others, it was like an angel speaking. Let's read verse 29 again. The crowd that was there and heard it, said it, had thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Verse 30, Jesus said, this voice was not was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. He is driving out Satan continually in our lives. When we let more of the Holy Spirit in, he is driving more of the devil out. I constantly pray, I renounce Satan and I cast him out. If you want to use those words in your prayers, do that. You renounce Satan and cast him out and plead the blood of Jesus over your lives, over your children's lives, over your grandchildren's lives, your greats and your grands. The voice of that came from heaven people's, was for people's benefits, that God is still real and still alive and moving. Jesus said, now is the time for judgment on this world because he was coming to separate the right from the wrong, the goats from the sheep, and he will do that on judgment day. The cross is not only a sign of judgment, it is also a sign of Satan's downfall, that Satan cannot and will not win, and he has already lost, that the cross is victory, that the cross has triumphed over death, that Jesus has triumphed over death. In that song I sing today, it talked about in broad terms, 
the penal substitution theory. Now in theology, I won't break this down too much and bore you to death, but that God's wrath has to be satisfied. That God, because he is holy and righteous, and a lot of you have heard this before, that he has to have justification. That's why Jesus is dead. But there's another theory out there is Christ's victor or victorious, that he has a victory over the grave because of God's love. And I subscribe more to that theory because it's not that God's wrath has to be satisfied, that his love has to be fulfilled. And his love will be fulfilled once we grasp hold of it. Therefore, Jesus says, now the prince of this world will be driven out. Not that I have to be satisfied, but that his love has to be fulfilled through my death on the cross. Jesus says, Satan's power over believers will be broken. His victory, his power in the end of the world will be utterly destroyed because in the end, he has victory over us. Verse 32, but I am lifted up from the earth and I will draw all men to myself. I've mentioned that several times leading up to this Sunday for this purpose. That is, when Jesus is lifted up on the cross, then he will be lifted up to heaven. So he was referring to the cross, that I'll be lifted up with the cross, but he had two, right? Two thieves, on, one on each side, and one cursed him, and one accepted him and said, he said, Jesus said to him that he will be with him in paradise today. So it wasn't just about the cross that he lifted up. That is one theory. That is one kind of old school theological theory, but also is that he will be lifted up in our hearts and our lives, that we are known by the cross. A cross, a sign of a loss in earthly terms, that someone died, a thief, a criminal. But we lift up the cross because it's victory. It's victory over death and victory in life because Christ did it and was buried, and in three days he rose again. Jesus says here, I will draw all men to myself. That means he will draw all believers who give him a chance and will draw believers from all nations, not just America, not just Canada, not just Western cultures, but from all nations. I will draw all men, all one who believe in me, to myself. In closing, Jesus has called us, he's called us to capture the lost, to seek the lost. Coming up in two Sundays, we have Easter, and this is one of the best times to invite people to church. If you have some friends, you have some family that don't go to church, tell them, just, just come this Sunday, all right? Come see our pastor. He makes fun of himself all the time. You can laugh at him. But Jesus calls all men to himself, not just the good ones, not just the ones who are acceptable, but all men to himself. And he wants to save all. Will you bow with me and pray? Father God, thank you. Thank you for your love on the cross, that you suffered and died, that you were willing to take the scourge the crown of thorns, the heavy lifting, the beating, the cursing, the spitting of them. Help us to walk in it. You took all that. Help us to take what you've called us to do, to live in you. You've already taken all the bad upon yourself. We just have to accept it and love in you and accept your love in our lives. Accept the Holy Spirit in our lives and love everyone around us. Help us to step out on faith and just say yes. And once we say yes, that we go a little bit deeper and we start to serve you, that we start to give up those things. And when those things are so scary that we start to give up, we realize we didn't really miss them at all. And it wasn't really that great. And what you give us in return is so much better. The sacrifice on the cross was hard for you but you were glad you did it. You were glad you obeyed the Father. And if we obey you, if we obey the Holy Spirit living in us, we will receive tenfold what we have. Help us to reach out, to stretch out, 
and to love one another and reach out and love this world and fulfill your kingdom that we can truly love everyone around us and lift up your name that we lift you up and you will draw all men to yourself we pray this in the mighty name of jesus amen, amen. and amen